Hello everyone, Kent Bressler here. I want to welcome you to Kent's Kidney Stories. During our time together um, over these podcasts, I'd like to uh, discuss kidney disease. I'd like to tell you about my journey as a transplant patient, but also talk about dialysis, kidney donation, and just about anything else that might be of interest. Kent's Kidney Stories podcast endorsed and sponsored by KidneySolutions.org. Hello ladies and gentlemen. I thought I'd kind of clean that up a little bit. This is Kent Bressler and um, we're fixing the podcast. And man, am I glad you're here today. I have a a real special friend and uh, she's not an acquaintance. She's become quite a friend and I can't wait to get to, uh, to talk about what we're, we're going to do. This is an anniversary party. This isn't a regular podcast for my, my travels or journeys. This is actually a podcast with someone who is having their kidney transplant anniversary. And in conjunction with uh, the American Association of Kidney Patients or AAKP, we have these logged on at the, the that website plus the kidney solutions or uh, kidney solutions website and also at uh, Kent's kidney stories. So before we start, I would like to uh, just offer a prayer up. I think it's important that we know where we're at in this life, and uh, so if I could just get you to bow your heads and in prayer i would appreciate it father i'm i'm tempted to worry about so many things our world is a mess at this present time i ask that you forgive me for focusing on anything or anyone but you thank you for the bible that equips and empowers me to live each day right now i declare that you are my only hope Please help me remember that you really are in control and help me to remember that also. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so long time ago, maybe about a year ago, and in my life, a long time is, you know, it's graduated. So, you, you know, I could be, just go to sleep and wake up and it's been a long time. But this gal that I met uh, in, a, in a program, and I think it was in D.C., uh, she's written a book. It's called uh, "In Pursuit of a Better Life: um, The Ultimate Guide for Finding Living Kidney Donors." And I think she's a sister warrior with me in her belief that preemptive transplant and finding a living donor is actually so much better in every respect that it constitutes making sure that that's what you're focused on. If you can get a living donor, that's really what we want to talk about. But today we're going to talk about her. Her name is Risa, like Risa's Pieces, <laughs> Simon, S-I-M-O-N. And uh, we're going to glide along and uh, get your ears on because we're, we don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to take just as long as it needs to. So Risa, golly, <laughs> welcome to the party. Thanks so much, Kent. Uh, thanks for having me on, and I'm honored to be your sister warrior. <laughs> Thank you for that. Listen, we, I have been, uh, I, I want to not talk about me. I want to talk about you a, a whole lot. Can you give me an idea uh, pre, uh, preoperatively? How long, first of all, how long have you been out uh, as a, as a kidney transplant patient, how long have you, how long have you been transplanted? So I'm celebrating my 10 year kidney anniversary. It'll be a June 8th, 2020. So, uh, 2010 was when I had it. So June 8th, 2020 will be the celebration. And I so appreciate this virtual celebration. Um, cause that's basically all we can do right now in, the, in our stay at home. And those of us that are immunocompromised, uh, need to stay out of harm's way. So this is, this is a really fun way for me to bring joy to this uh, incredible 
journey and success story. I hope to join the Kent Club of 33 years. <laughs> so I look forward to that. But for yeah. now, I'm, I'm going to em embrace and feel very grateful for my 10 years um, of uh, transplant success with a living kidney donor, a non-related living kidney donor. See, mine was related. So, I mean, different strokes for different folks, right? Right. Um, living donor is important. Exactly. And, and my, my donor, um, let's, when we get maybe a little bit more in, into her story, but uh, she referred to me as a kindred spirit when we first met, um, kind of like you're referring to me as a sister warrior. Um, she was in healthcare administration and transplant center and uh, recognized that we both uh, shared an equal passion for allowing uh, individuals in need to advance to transplant without the hurdles. Um, and that kindred spirit uh, ironically turned into, and I shouldn't say ironically, it was really more of a blessing. The, the HLA lab showed us to be matching as close as siblings. So <laughs> there's something beyond oh. the uh, kindred spirit. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you, uh, do you, do you remember, I know it's been 10 years, like, uh, that's a long time, believe it or not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long time to be transplanted. Um, I know several people who have gone so much longer, and we always dwell so much on, on the amount of time you get away from a transplant. And I don't, I like to think of, uh, in these programs, when you talk about your anniversary, what was it like before? Do you remember what it was like before you got transplanted? Oh, yes. Um, you know, it's it's funny. We do dwell more on or, or sit in the pocket of gratitude and think about all these wonderful things that have happened to us as we get our second chance at a better life, better and longer life. But, you know, when I think back, even though I consider myself one of the the lucky ones, because I was able to receive, like you, a preemptive transplant, was able to bypass dialysis, all that was is just you know so amazing it's such an amazing package all bundled up but i i turned i turned the clock back and i i look back to um what my greatest challenges and fears were and uh while it takes a moment to get them to resurface because it does seem a long like a long time ago um my first challenge of course was my diagnosis i was diagnosed with the same genetic disease that my father lost the battle to in his early 40s. That was polycystic kidney disease. Oh, and, PKD. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I was told in my younger years I did not have that gene, and uh, I, was, I was good to go. And then in my oh. early 20s, I oh. was told otherwise. Yeah, so that was, that was startling. Oh. And I lived a number of years in fear. Um, of course, I, I tried to bounce around in the full gamut of emotions from fear to uh, putting on my rose colored glasses to um, dipping into denial and then just saying, well, this won't happen to me. I'm a healthy person. You know, I eat healthy. Yeah. I live healthy. This won't happen to me. And uh, then, of course, it caught up with me. But fortunately, I repurposed that fear into uh, an unstoppable desire to fight for a better life. And I didn't really know what that was all about, but I was very curious, like you can't, you know, we just, of course you were in healthcare, um, but it was just so curious. I just felt like there, I didn't know all that I needed to know. All I knew is that my, do, my, that my father had um, suffered for so long on dialysis and then died and at far yeah. too early age. So I was thinking, okay, well, I guess I'm going to follow in his footsteps and I'll be on dialysis. And the second phase of fear and challenge that came up for me in that same bundle was um, that, uh, you know, my, my doctor really wasn't telling me about anything other than dialysis. There wasn't any conversation on transplant or preemptive transplant. Who, who, knew, it? who knew that term, right? Yeah. What, what the heck was yeah. that? I had to go to a patient conference to learn that one. And um, so that second phase was really going in to see my nephrologist, looking, you know, I was starving for hope. And I was looking for some good news. And it didn't have to be good news that we're going to cure you. But hey, guess what? There's something else you could be doing now because this whole idea of being productive when we feel like we can't do anything is so powerful. And I, I didn't get that. And I was questioning, I suspected he didn't have my best interest at heart because as I was learning outside the sacred walls of that exam room, that there were some other options and that I needed to step up to those options and get to work and become my own best advocate. 
But those lab numbers really threw me for a loop. I'll tell you, Kent. I mean, there as you, you know, we live from lab to lab, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't they scare you? Yeah. You know, I was I was trained. I was an RN working in di uh, di dialysis and working with kidney patients, and they scared the day. It was me. It wasn't. You know, it's somebody else now. It's me. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because in my previous life, before I kind of jumped ship from my real career, my real job, which was in the dental profession where I was speaking and consulting and I'd written a couple books there as well. And I, I could go into a ballroom and speak to 900 people at a state convention, but getting into that, you know, uh, what is it, 100 by 100 square feet of uh, space with one physician, namely my nephrologist, I was shaking in my boots and I couldn't even retain half the things that he or she was saying because all I, you know, my head was spinning thinking about my dad, thinking about it's the end. Yeah, if you were think, you're thinking, the worst case possible case scenario at the beginning. Correct. And that's really almost everybody. No one just says, oh, yeah, well, I'm accepting. It is the worst case scenario when you're diagnosed because you don't know what's going to happen. And you haven't been told any differently. So you, no. you just don't know. You haven't heard your story or other stories um, no. to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Maybe I can do what Kent did. Maybe, you know, and that was really the third uh, part of that preoperative preoperative uh, fear factor or challenge is I had learned that um, the best thing to do was to avoid dialysis and to avoid dialysis, I had to find a living kidney donor. And, and if I didn't, I had no idea how many people were waiting on a list. How many kidney patients do? I mean, unless you're attending these seminars, nobody's really taught your, your doctor isn't coming in. By the way, there's 95,000 people waiting on a list. So take that home and <laughs> sleep on that one. Work on um, that. Yeah. And tell me how that goes. So that that surely wasn't coming up. And we, we don't know that the risks while you're waiting for a, a transplant that you could actually lose transplant eligibility through comorbidities and other illnesses that sure. how long you have to wait with the wait being anywhere what from three to nine plus years, depending where you are. This was just all crazy, crazy talks town. So I thought, oh, my gosh, there's so much I did not know. And that's why I and individuals like yourself are so dedicated to saying, man, if I didn't know it, of course, you knew a lot. But if I didn't know it, how many other people don't know it, um, don't know about this proven pathway to a longer and better life? If we're not getting the uh, encouragement or information from our doctor's offices, because we think those are our advisors, right? Our doctors are our advisors. Right, right, We're not getting it there. Right. And we don't know about the AAKPs of the world. What? The AAKPs and stuff like that are the, the most important stuff. Wow, but you've had 10 years of experience now. Yeah. See that? And I've had 30. <laughs> and if I look back to when I, I can still remember the things that happened preoperatively. And yeah. that's the, that. And then, so it goes from pre-op, to doing the actual surgery in the day and all that kind of stuff. And then it's living with it, which is yeah. the most important part, I think. But in, in your case, in your case, uh, when you, when you finally got through and you realize you're going to, you're going to get a transplant, that's what you really wanted to do. It is outlined spectacularly in your book. This is a literal cookbook of opportunity for people to learn when they know absolutely nothing. All right. It gives them everything. From from A to Z, and then probably everything else after that into infinity. It's a great book. All right. Thank, Thank you. I, it's my hope. I, I that's what I yeah. hope is that the whole the whole purpose of of publishing that piece of work was to to be the pocket coach, if you will, the mentor um, yep. for those that don't have an opportunity um, to to get outside the walls of their exam rooms and discover more. And and you know, into to the nephrologist and all the healthcare uh, professionals defense, who has the time to do the work that you and I do? I mean, who has the, they're, they're, they can barely get through the labs. And, um, you know, if I can just empower patients to get into their portal, get their labs, get their questions <laughs> written down and come in, Absolutely. arrive to that appointment with some targeted questions and to share what their goals are. And hopefully, fingers crossed, they don't have their nephrologist roll their eyes and just say, hey, get on the table. 
Um, you know, I want, we want to be heard. We want someone to know that, hey, we're willing to do what it takes to live a better and longer life, but we need your help. We can't do it alone. Um, and when I requested to have a, an evaluation, um, I was told it was too early, way ahead of the eight ball, and I just wasn't okay. sick enough yet. Yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, you did what you did. In other words, you, you progressed. Jason, uh, when I've worked with Jason, I always tell him, stay in his own lane. This mm -hmm. passing business doesn't work. Stay in your own lane and try to learn as much as you possibly can. And in your case, you've done that. And it's only going to get better because you're going to add from what other you, you learn from other people. So the transplant experience for you has been positive. And that's what we do now is give hope to people. Yes. It's not because you try to get to be 30 years out or 20 years out. That's your goal. But when you tell somebody you're that far out, it's not to brag. It's to say, listen, you have hope. It can be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can be done. So when you had the day, do you remember anything particularly important about the day you were transplanted? Oh, yeah. I, I remember showing up bright and early, um, waiting for my living donor to also show up. And we were at the same transplant center, which was wonderful. Um, and uh, I just remember, you know, oddly enough, <laughs> you're going to appreciate this, Kent, being a nurse, but oddly enough, I wasn't concerned about the surgery um, as much as and I had voiced some of these concerns in advance, as much as I was concerned about uh, getting a nosocomial infection, just oh. this infection control process, because I had been in dentistry and I was teaching infection control and OSHA compliance, it was in my brain and it was stuff that I couldn't unsee. And I was like, oh gosh, you know, I'm going to be immunosuppressed. And I remember I even had some signs put up in my... Uh, in my recover, not my recovery, but my actual room after transplant. And I know that the uh, professionals that came into the room didn't quite understand what I meant by that. It was so funny. I met someone post uh, transplant a few years out and they, oh, I remember you. I cared for you. You're the one that had that note in the room. We never did understand what that meant. <laughs> it was like, oh, well, <laughs> so much for trying. But yeah, that was, that was probably my biggest concern in addition to worrying, of course, about my donor, you know, making this huge sacrifice to improve my life. I wanted to make sure she uh, was not put in harm's way and that on the other end that we'd both be coming out out fine. And I, I would also say that there was a very strong possibility that I was going to have a, a, a double nephrectomy uh, because of my PKD kidney. Oh, sure. I yeah. didn't have I enough re real estate, right? Yeah. That's one thing, you know, that you, you might touch on right, while we're, we're on that. They don't always take kidneys out, but in some cases they have to. So can you expound on that a little bit? Sure, my pleasure. Um, you're right. It is uncommon. Um, it's more the exception than the norm, especially same day as transplant. Um, I know that a few members of the committee, the transplant committee that were defining how this whole process was going to take, at, take place and and if in fact I could have those kidneys removed um, with polycystic kidney disease you also have a propensity to have cysts on other organs especially your liver so my liver, liver. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so my liver even though it is in excellent function if you if you did an autopsy on me right now you'd think oh my gosh that poor girl she has horrible uh, liver disease because there are multiple uh, too they, numerous to count cysts on the liver. So they had to work around the liver to remove. I mean, this surgeon was a genius. So I wasn't sure if they were able to come out. I wasn't given the 100% promise, not that anybody is with any surgery. Um, but with me, because I'm petite, and there wasn't a lot of real estate and there was a lot of discomfort. And I even had, you know, it was hard to, to eat and enjoy it and not have because my stomach was pushing on my stomach oh. and the, between yeah. the, liver, the liver and the kidneys. So um, I, I was very blessed that they made the decision, like, go in there. If you can get them, get them. And yeah. I guess you could call me, Kent, you could call me a, uh, a kidney donor, too, because uh, I had the double nephrectomy. I just didn't donate to save someone's life, I hope, because it went into the red bag and shipped over to the research yeah. center for helping to find a treatment and a cure for PKD that hopefully I'd like to believe anyway that that they could uh, that they offered up some some uh, good information for their research. Yeah. 
Yeah, because a lot of people when I that I've talked to, they say, well, do you still have your kidneys? Well, yeah, I do. They're not much of kidneys anymore. But in case of PKD, my, I have a different diagnosis of several diagnoses for kidney disease. One, mine's FSGS, yours is PKD. Right. In PKD, in PKD uh, it, it's, it's a very strange disease. It's, it's <laughs> not, not common at all. It's a, a rare disease. Yeah, it, it is. It, it's it's something that, and the way that it manifests, and there's so you know the the uh, generations can be um, uh, impacted by it in many different ways. Oftentimes, you you know that's why my thinking of oh, I'm going to follow in my dad's footsteps, and perhaps I could have had I not found the information, had I not exactly. knew. You know, there's there's something to be said that obviously our healthcare professionals, we can't live without them and we so rely on their expertise, their knowledge and skill. But as patients, we need to give ourselves permission to diplomatically and professionally use our voice to uh, share our our fears and our goals. And if the goals are incongruent to what's best for us, then tell us so. But we, we kind of need to go on record as to, look, I'm willing to do the work. I know a lot of people that get waitlisted and they just sit back and, and they're going, well, I, I guess I just wait for the call. They're, they're not even thinking yeah. outside that box. But they have never been provided an opportunity preemptively to talk to somebody who's experienced it. That's the problem. You can talk to all the nephrologists. They like, they understand it. They realize it. They work with it. But they're not geared to think at stage three, uh, stage four, let's start talking kidney transplant. And that, I think, that's my opinion. I think that's what's happening here. Well, and they, they are embracing it now. I really, I really see a big change. You're right. You're right. There has been uh, some huge improvements, no doubt about it. Um, and, and I agree with you, uh, earlier stages, and I would even take it one step further, Ken. I would say, hey, when I'm diagnosed, why don't you sort of dangle that pearl or carrot, whatever we want to call it, and say, hey, this isn't the end. There, There's a whole world out there that can be explored, and it's in your hands right now. Because guess what? You're healthy enough to take the time to do the work. You don't want to get people when they're sick and fatigued and don't have the energy and they're having their pity parties. And I get all that. I've been there. Yeah. Um, but you, we, we've got to we, – it, it's so valuable. Again, I'll circle back to the, if we can be productive, if we can help ourselves, we can help others, if we can believe that a better future is possible, then we can attract that better future to ourselves. And I'm a big believer in that. You, you also believe in being given opportunity, giving options, being given options versus uh, ultimatums. And when you when you get one, two, three, four, and five, here are your options. Here are your, the things that you can do, and I can help you do any one of these. But let's at least explore all of them so you're well versed. And I think that's where you're you're coming from. That's where I come from. Anyway. Yes, so. yeah, and I think that again we look to our physicians for advice. If I remember the first little in-service training that I had in my nephrologist's office where a nurse from a dialysis center came in to, to teach us that first phase. And it was dialysis and transplant. There were a couple videos that were shown. And at the end of the video, Kent, there was a little poll. There was only about six of us and the other five folks, because I asked to get into the class early. So I don't think they could bill, because as you know, Medicare only covers it once you're in stage four and five. Oh, yeah, so I yeah. think I was in stage three and um, leaning towards stage four. And I remember looking around the room and thinking, boy, these guys are half asleep. Are they bored? No, they they were just were lifeless uh, because they didn't have any hope and they didn't know any different. And no. and and th when the nurse had said, OK, well, let's just take a poll. How many of you'd like to have dialysis? And of course, we went around with the PD or hemo. And then how many of you feel like you'd like a transplant? I was the first to raise my hand with PD. Now, you tell me why I thought that was better. Well, the video showed this really happy couple, and I didn't have to have the major surgery, and I could do it at home. That's all <laughs> I knew. And I said, well, I'll do PD. <laughs> and look at me now. I mean, thank God. Again, I, I just am so grateful for organizations that put on patient meetings and that 
provide uh, information to individuals that aren't healthcare professionals like yourself that that you know don't really know what our options are. So if I pick that, I would hope that my physician would say, "Hey, I understand that this is what you prefer, and that's an excellent option for dialysis. Um, tell me why you think dialysis, or excuse me, why transplant may not be a better option for you. Let's just chat about that for a minute, and let's and and maybe we need some of those charts of the more mortality rates and the risks and, you know, the life, the challenges of three, minimum three times a week, minimum four hours a day. What's life like? You know, those are some realities that we really need to get square with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in your transplant experience, what was the absolute, now we're talking, you've had the transplant already. When you woke up after the transplant and you started getting all the the nutritionist coming in and the, you know getting you getting you ready to go. What was your biggest fear? Not you, you know you feared the surgery. Everybody fears the surgery. The post op. What was your biggest fear going home? Going home. Well, um, specifically the day that they were releasing me, I had some shoulder pain that, and I believe it was from the laparoscopic procedure. You know, I think that gas can kind of move up to different areas and it was pretty severe. And I don't take or am able to take any type of narcotic, never have narcotic medications for pain and me don't agree. I will be, my, my body will say, sorry, and it'll be out of my body before you know it, but I get very, very sick. And I remember telling them that, uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to be on any pain medication. So um, they said, don't worry. And, you know, they gave me the scripts and I said, no, I really, I can't do that. I ended up taking Tylenol, extra strength Tylenol, my full post-op, but it was more manage than pain without taking narcotics. And um, of, of course, wanting to make sure my donor was okay and that uh, I wouldn't be too much of a burden for my husband, who was my caregiver, um, because I did have a relatively huge surgery being that I had the double nephrectomy and, yeah. and the transplant. Surgery. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that, that, that was probably it. I just wanted to make sure everything was connected, was working well. And um, you know, the volumes of urine that, that we collect after transplant, it's just a, a total celebration, I guess, even on the trans uh, on the surgical table, as you well know, being a, healthcare professional that uh, I think they call it their yellow champagne party. Um, there, someone had taken some pictures of that once the ureter, right, is, is attached. Yeah, once, and then, yeah, then it goes. Yeah. 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 So that's pretty exciting stuff. But yeah, I think it was more that. And then, of course, immunosuppression. How many drugs am I? How many medications am I going to have to take? And they were quite high in the beginning. And I was put on, believe it or not, um, I considered oh, yeah. this 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 number seemed very high to me, and I think I was more concerned because my father was on super high doses of prednisone back in the day. So they had me on 10 milligrams when I left orally, right, and the Tacro. And that 10 milligrams, I'll tell you, Ken, I, I was crying at commercials. <laughs> I was crying at anything. And <laughs> yeah, I was just losing it. And Did you? Yeah. Did you get to reduce that course? What are you on right now? I'm on 3.75. I, I was able I was able to get the green light to go down to, to uh, 2.5, but I and I went down to 2.5, sort of wean myself down. But then I found at 2.5 that my joints were starting to ache a little bit. And I know my nurse coordinators were saying, "You don't want to get off this. Trust me, you're going to be in more pain." Um, well, now I kind of understand what they were talking about. Um, yeah. But yeah. so yeah, but I'm and I'm only on um, 1.5 of Tacro, and I'm thrilled about that. I am on a once daily extended release, so I don't take medications morning and night. Um, and no program. No, only in the morning because it's sustained release. So that's the yeah. tacro, yeah. Yeah, and this, I'm, I meant uh, Celsep. No, not taking Celsep, and I think it's because um, the. Um, the day after transplant, there were some gastrointestinal issues going on, and they just said, take her off because that's a, an immediate side effect of, of um, CELSEP. So they took me off of that. So yeah, I've only been on these two meds. So I'm very great. Well, of course, I had some other ones the first, what, three to six months, the yeah, um, antifungal yeah. and all those great things. But Fungal. yeah, I feel, I feel really lucky that I only take, what, it's three pills a day, and they're all in the morning. Uh, the 
prednisone is just separated by a couple hours from my tacro so that I can eat with the prednisone. And that's about, yeah, that's about it. And it's, it's great because I had insomnia. Ken, I don't know if you deal with that or ever well, dealt with it. <laughs> tell me who does it. I want to know. That's what I'm going to do something about that, too. I'm Would you? Are you going to invent something to help yeah, us all? No. Oh, I like I'm it. Gonna have, I'm going to have it. All the insomniacs, a transplanted <laughs> insomniac, come on my show because I'll bet you I can't get them all on. The, everybody <laughs> I've talked yep, to has. Yep. That yeah, would be a great idea. Care. Yeah, it would yeah. be a great idea. It's a good club to have. But boy, yeah. of course, you know, just going through that type of surgery and having nurses come in every hour, even though you start to maybe sort of, you think you might have kind of dozed off. And they're like, wake up, got to oh. take your blood pressure, got to do this, got to do that. And they're like, no, go away. Um, and of course, then all the infection control stuff. And where were they? What are they doing? Do they have new gloves on? Are they wearing a mask? So yeah, there was all that kind of goofy stuff going on. But uh, yeah, the insomnia thing, if I, I've discovered, and maybe, you know, sometimes whatever we think kind of becomes our reality. And in my mind, I was feeling that I had insomnia for two reasons. One, if my prednisone was higher than it absolutely needed to be. And yeah. two, if I was taking medications at night, because my body's going, oh, you just gave me something. Let me just process that for a while. <laughs> and it's like, you yeah. know, it's not time to go to sleep. We have some work to do. <laughs> the, see, that's, I've never been able to turn it off. I don't think you can either. As a matter of fact, I know you can't. Uh, you know what I'm saying? When <laughs> oh, yeah. Old, when you have all those thoughts going here and there, I don't care what kind of peace that you try to get into. Your sleep, my sleep pattern, as an example, just happens whatever the day it is. You know, if, if I can sleep for five or six hours a night, fine. But insomnia has been with me all along. I thought I could fix it, but I'm 70 now. I haven't fixed it. It's getting yeah. worse. So, yeah. Yeah. You have and to I live I, with it and learn it. Living with it, yes. And I guess that I sort of try to manage it as well. Again, maybe it's yeah. psychosomatic. I don't know. And I really don't care as long as I'm sleeping. But I will tell you for me, taking magnesium, because Tacro can lower your magnesium. So yeah. taking more magnesium, taking that at night has been a big help. Making sure that I'm not stimulated at night, meaning I didn't have an exciting call with Kent about how we're going to <laughs> conquer the world and save all the <laughs> kidney patients. That kind of stuff would get my mind just going and cooking and thinking about planning seminar, whatever. So that, yeah. that stuff, even yeah. a show, a TV show that excited my mind, if it was music or dance or uh, drama. It can yeah, excite exactly. my mind to, to weird places. So, yeah, I just try I try not to take too many uh, mentor. I don't know about you, but even my mentoring calls, I try to do no, no later I, than like two o'clock yep. in the afternoon. I try to I try to gear it back. I think yeah. that's the only way. I mean, you're you're programmed to succeed. I, I, that's what you tell Jason. You're programmed to succeed and you can't suppress that that being able to be successful and success means thinking. And if you got can't shut your thinking <laughs> off, you're not going to sleep. So, okay. So that's, that's one thing. Here's something I really, I, I, I don't want to forget. So I'm going to say it right now. Please. I, I want to know, and I think I hope everybody, who, anybody who's listening, tell me about your donor that, that really actually, I know nothing about your donor. Have no clue anything about your donor, but I want to. I want to know about your donor. Sure, gosh, that would be my pleasure to talk up my donor because she's just my hero, and um, yeah, it's just it doesn't get any better than someone doing what a living kidney donor would do for an individual, and even if you know they're in the paired or you never meet them, it's just in such an incredible gift. But Kent, you and I know our donors. Yours was related, mine was not. And she was just an incredible human being. And she, number one, she's in healthcare. Number two, she happened to be in charge. She was the administrator of the transplant center where I was transplanted. I happened chance really? to meet her. Yes, I happened chance to meet her because number of my potential donors were circling back to me. And, and that's a story in itself that it took me six individuals to find her. 
um, over a course of two years. So for anybody listening to the podcast thinking, oh, I just need one donor. Well, you'll be very lucky if that's all you need. But some oh, people yeah. need a dozen. I mean, I had two dozen people. I was very, very fortunate. I had two dozen people lean in my direction. You know what that means that they didn't say here, take my kidney, but they were, Hey, how could I help? I want to know more about your story. And many of those two dozen were not healthy enough or young enough, but it was just so heartwarming to have somebody lean forward and, and say, how can I help? Because sharing our story is really all we're asking for. We're never, I, I never personally can ask someone outright, never thought of, and that's what we talk about in the book. You know, it's just an unimaginable ask to ask somebody to give you a kidney. I mean, I don't even, I don't know about you, Kim, but I don't even like to ask, to borrow five bucks from anybody, let alone ask them, ask them for an organ. So <laughs> with, with uh, Melissa, she, she not only understood the process, but she, she could see in her perspective, in what she calls kind of an opportunity to do good, not just for someone, but for someone who could, after they receive their transplant, continue the good. So the work continues. So, cause you can imagine how many people she could have picked out of the crowd. I was oh, blown sure. away that the happen chance experience, what came about because some of my potential donors were coming back to me and saying the transplant center never called me back. Or yeah. the transplant center said I wasn't needed. Or the transplant center said I'm not the right blood type. Next. Um, never any conversation about paired. And, and by the way, they weren't um, not they weren't incompatible. So I don't even know where all that came from. But nonetheless, I asked to speak, you know, again, patient trying to be an advocate, trying to maintain professionalism and being diplomatic and very kind and understanding. Of course, you don't want to become, I think, what some patients are called PETAs, right? Yes. So that you're blackballed. But I said, hey, you know, can I talk to a manager? And that wasn't really um, some something that anybody really wanted to do for me. But I eventually got to that appointment. And then I was told by the person I was, uh, by the secretary, the person I was supposed to meet, that she wasn't available that day, but this other person, Melissa, would be coming in. And I thought, oh, great, it's a secretary, secretary. Um, and as it turned out, she was in charge. Um, it, it was just, it was amazing. I didn't realize that I had gone to the, the, the top of uh, the tree there. And I didn't know that at the time when I shared some of my concerns, I said, look, I'm starting to educate kidney patients and I want to make sure I give them the right information. And some of my potential donors have been circling back to me, telling me things that the desk is saying to them when they're calling in. Now it's more of an online engagement. Um, yes. But uh, she, she just, you know, kind of jaw dropped and pencil out and taking copious notes. And I said, oh, my gosh. This isn't somebody playing poker and, and keeping the face, the happy face of, well, I can assure you everything is fine. She just kept writing and writing and saying, I will get back to you on this. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. I was floored I, in, in a very good way, of course. Um, and we met three times. The third time we met and each time we were talking about in general kidney patients and the path to transplant and how it is more of a Herculean effort rather than um, an opportunity with a gate opening, it, it became, there, there was more pushback from my own nephrologist especially. And so she wanted, you know, she was very eager to make that process easier that she recognized how unfair it was and how patients can become complacent. And so she said, you know, let's meet again. And we met. And the third time we met, um, she's again asked me, how are you doing with your potential donors? At that point, I had five. And the fifth one was actually um, a uh, detective who had every intention of donating to me and no showed for an appointment. So um, for her testing. So I thought, thank God, you know, at first you're thinking, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. What if she no showed for the, tr the surgery? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you for having her no show to testing. This is if that's what would happen. And of course, everybody has their lives and things change. But she said, well, you know, I've been thinking long and hard about this. And I've decided that I'm going to give you one of my kidneys. I'm healthy. I'm she at the right age. You that right, right in, the, in the meeting with her. Right in the right, meeting. You were, we actually were having yeah. a lunch, Kent, and it was really, uh, could you pass the peas? It was kind of like, could you pass the peas? And oh, by the way, I decided to, <laughs> to donate one of my kidneys to you. I mean, literally, I had to look at the ground and make sure my feet were still there because I, yeah, you right. know, 
I, I did yeah. a double take right. and of course moved to the moon and back um, because in my wildest dreams, Kent, I never oh. thought that someone, and this is why I tell our mentees, you know, just where the, the, probably the last person you ever expect is going to be a person that's going to pass your way and exactly. either help you get your story out or be the one. And so yep. never think, I mean, all our prejudging needs to go out the window and we need to just open ourselves up. We need to surrender to the good that we attract, keep putting the good out there. And if we are doing this, I'm a big believer in this, and I know you agree, that if we're doing this for everyone else, not just ourselves, that's when the universe brings the good pearls back our way. And especially when we don't expect it. So she, always, she was amazing. I always said in my in, in wor working with folks that I work with, it's not the issue of asking so much. It has to happen. But it's the idea that re you remember that you'll ask, that doesn't mean they will, but the Lord will send them to you. It, that makes it a lot easier, I think, if, you, if they know that it's not something that's on them, that the Lord has it. He's going to send that person. That person will show up in your life, but it'll it, be at his time. It's interesting um, because there are a number, and I know that you've heard the stories, but I surely have as well, um, that a number of individuals who either wanted to be a donor or who, who became someone's donor say that it was a God thing. Um, oh, yeah, say they does. were moved by a higher power. And, um, and I always say, you know, donation is not for everyone. And there, there is no shame. I know a lot of living kidney donors, they get so excited about the process and God bless them for being so excited and enthusiastic. But I, I never want their story to shame someone that isn't yeah. supposed to be doing this for all the reasons, could be various, medical and otherwise. Um, we want all parties to come out on the other end uh, in good health and to be feeling as if they, um, many donors say, you know, it was one of the greatest achievements of their life. In fact, my, my donors sent me a text the other day and said that, um, it was one of the great privileges of her life. And sure. I got to tell you, Ken, as recipients, you and I know it's we it's almost like, OK, well, we may agree to disagree, but it's the truth. And I believe it. I accept it. But it's hard to accept it because we're the ones that received. Um, it's there's such no a better, joy to know they get something out of it, too. There's no better feeling mm. than to be able to get up in the morning. Go into the bathroom, and go to the bathroom. <laughs> Either go back and lay down in bed and go back to sleep or go out and start your day. Yeah. And, and that, that is about as simple as it gets. But I'm telling you, that's a kidney transplant. That is the difference between dialysis and death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be untethered, just to be untethered and Absolutely. filled with gratitude. It, yep. it's, it's, a, it's, you know medical miracles with God's blessing. It's, it's all of, of, you know, this is what gives me, and I'm sure you, as you're describing it, incredible joy. And what is life without joy? What is life without hope? And we, we want to give hope to those that are listening to this podcast, of course, and the joy, the abundant, never ending joy, you know, and, and, and to keep things real, Ken, I'll tell you for myself, I live from lab to lab. And what I mean by that is I have this tremendous joy and I have this gratitude and I am, but I, I'm a, I'm a human being. And when we get back to that fear factor and the challenges, I never take anything for granted and I do not assume, and I'm prepared to do whatever it is I need to do. So with each, with each lab, I of course hope for the best, but I tell myself that I'm going to be strong enough um, to fight the fight and do what I need to do. And all of my labs have been phenomenal. Occasionally, there'll be something that's a little bit <laughs> off, a little high or a little low. And of course, being the perfectionist that I am, I'm immediately in the portal talking to my doctors. Is it okay if I'm 0.5 high in this? Area? It's like, oh, live your life. This is fabulous. I don't even have any patients that have your numbers, right? But is it, that's true, though. Isn't that the reason you had the transplant? Yeah. You didn't have the transplant to survive, you had it to live. Yes. 
Yes. And, I, you know, I've always been yeah. a person, I've always felt that I have appreciated things in life, but boy, receiving this gift, living this life, um, which I hope lasts, as I say, I, I hope someday we will be at my 30 plus years and you're that much further um, along, what, 40 plus uh it, and and we're still talking about all these amazing things that we've achieved and done and people that we've met along our way. It's just so heartwarming. It's so heartwarming. I can't I can't imagine I can't imagine someone not being appreciative. And I think about the people that have more than one transplant and how yes. how skewed. But they know they know the importance and you know a lot of people say well they didn't take care of it or they didn't do no that's not it at all the disease process this kidney disease that we have whether it be pkd or fsgs iga any of them, any of these kidney diseases which i might add are all rare yeah the only thing that brings us back is the fact that we can be transplanted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right whether it be once, whether it be twice, and please, in your mind, if everybody's listening, because a person loses a transplant, only thing that means is they're going on to their net because it's not because they didn't take care of it. It's because it didn't work out. There are yeah. too many variables to put it over on the psyche of some individual. They yeah. do the best that they can. And the disease process works its own way. I've spent my whole life thinking next time I go in for my blood work, FSGS may be back. Mm. 30 years of that. Mm. Yeah. But think, about, think about what you said. You know in your heart the most important thing you ever did in your life was have a transplant. Oh, yeah. Is there anything else? Could you tell me something else in your life that was more important? No, I cannot. No, me neither. I can't even I can't even describe something else. Yeah. Oh, I'm married and all that kind of stuff. I get it. But I'm talking about the sheer pleasure of life. Yeah. Right? And and I have never had any children, but uh, that's why I usually refer to Melissa's kidney, um, which, by the way, I've uh, renamed as MAC, M-A-K, for Melissa's Amazing Kidney. I feel like I adopted, and she's never had children either. So yeah. she donated uh, her kidney, and, and um, you know, it, it's to me, I feel like I adopted her baby. And the baby yeah. is, is now mine, but it's still known as Melissa's Amazing Kidney. And Mac talks to Melissa often and to Moak. Moak is M-O-A-K, Melissa's other amazing kidney. And Mac, Mac uh, not only uh, tells Melissa how much she appreciates the journey that she sent her on and that she assures her that her new mother is taking good care of her, but she mostly sends appreciation to Moak for doing the work of two and keeping her mother safe. And I just think that's so important. <laughs> I've never, I've never, I've never named my kidney. That's another one. I've never done it, but I've had this, I've gone back and forth. I think I did a podcast on it about the odd man out or, and then whose kidney is it? You know, is it my kidney or my brother's kidney? Well, it's both of ours, but, you know, just th that thought process. Yes. It, it, it's, it's, the, I can't explain the joy I have. And now as I age, I think to myself, what's going to happen if, because of the aging process, my kidney fail? I don't think there. I, I think like you, it's better just to think, be in the moment today, work yes. it today, and deal with what comes. Don't anticipate it, but deal with it when it gets mm -hmm. here. That thought that you had is exactly the way I think. And I hope a lot of people will take away with that. Uh, take yeah. away from this talk. Don't, don't, don't be a numbers person. Don't be a, a fanatic about, oh, is it back or is it not coming back or will it be back? Or, you know, think about what I'm going to do today with my life to help somebody else. What am I going to do to help another kidney patient? Because I know you, like me, are going to draw your last breath help them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We certainly don't want to be on our deathbed saying, oh, I just I didn't do 
whatever it is that you feel like you have to do instead of helping kidney patients. I didn't do enough of, uh, you know, I didn't do yeah, enough of this or that. This it's, or that. Yeah. Yeah. But the sheer thought of not being able to have been, I'm so joyful of having had a transplant so I can live. Mm. And the sheer thought that I've lived as long as I have with this kidney is hope for others. Mm -hmm. That's the same way I hope, I, I pray for you, Risa, that you go out and just as long as you possibly can. And God will determine that before you. you. You know that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Have we missed anything? No, I, I guess if anything, I would just underscore, um, and I, I think you're part of this club too. I just feel like one of the luckiest gals in the whole wide world. And I know that as it's been said, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And and uh, I just want to encourage anyone listening to this is you don't just go, oh, okay, I'm just going to do what I normally do and luck will come my way. I mean, it could. <laughs> but what are the odds? I mean, learn, yeah, as, right. learn as much as you can, connect to people like Kent, um, and and get um, get yourself in the know so that you can empower that process when you're talking to your nephrologist. You know, even though I was talking, I wanted to preemptive transplant, that referral didn't get in. And, and as many people might be told, and I hear from a lot of our mentees, well, I was told I have to be way under 20 GFR before they'll send me over to the transplant center. No, um, no. I actually was evaluated at 25 GFR. Now, yeah. maybe I know that transplant centers can be overwhelmed and understaffed, and it takes a while to get people through the process. But do your due diligence and be persistent. Um, be persistent, but be kind and diplomatic with being persistent. And if if need be, call the transplant center directly. Many of them will take your referral directly. They don't have to be referred. Absolutely, to absolutely. You don't you don't have to have Doctor X send it in. No, you can walk in the clinic. Well, that's a little bit difficult with the virus and everything. But you can walk over to the clinic, put your name down, tell them you want to see a doc. It's yeah, not a problem. That's great. Wow. Isn't that a problem? Yeah. And then you say to them, and then when you say to them, they're, by the way, I'm bringing my, my potential donor with them. They're all over it. Oh, yeah. They should all be. Right. <laughs> they should be. I hope that they have enough folks to. You're to in the wrong place. Everyone. <laughs> right. And, you know, and last thing I think I'd say because of COVID, you know, many of the living donor transplants said, well, they're back up. They're getting back up again. I'm seeing some very they positive. Are. You're seeing the same numbers, I'm sure. So I'm yep. very pleased. Yep. But there was a period of time where I was talking to a couple of mentees and they were saying, oh, my gosh, you know, my cousin, my friend, whatever. The transplant center just said, stay home. We're not doing anything for a long old while. So you just stay home. Well, if there is if you were caught up in the pause or you're still in the catch up of the pause, please keep yourself healthy. Please oh, keep yeah. others around you healthy and know that um, I always feel breakdown, breakthrough. If, if something didn't happen when you thought it was going to happen, you're going to break through on the other side and something even better is going to happen. Just like the five donors that didn't qualify or didn't show up before Melissa, that was all meant to be. Melissa was supposed to be my donor. And right. honestly, that's, that's I don't it. think I'd be the person that I am had I not experienced those disappointments um, exactly. along the way. Because I can understand a little more when I'm talking to other, you know, our fellow kidney patients. So, yeah, I think that's what I would I would leave as some some parting uh, suggestions that, um, uh, like you said, you know, you stay in the present and um, just be the best that you can be. And believe in a better tomorrow and, and enjoy today as much as you can. Exactly. If you're waiting, don't worry. If you've got it, then start working. If you've had your transplant, get to work. Yeah. That's the most important thing I can leave. Listen, I want to do a, uh, I'm going to do a comeback with you at some point in time. And I'd like to just talk about, the idea of getting a transplant, and I think we're going to do that. I appreciate your story, and I appreciate you coming in. You're a great friend, and uh, let's cultivate. Let's let's make it better. Let's uh, let's help people, and uh, let's do it together. I I would really love to do that. Thank you, Kent. I'm I'm all, all in. Right. I want to thank you for having me on. It's uh, it was tr truly a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Well, it's fun, and that and and Jason, listen, as we always say. Everybody, uh, stay smart, stay healthy, be your own advocate. Always take care of yourself. The most important thing is keep breathing. Mm, like that. Mm -hmm.